Greetings, I'm Elizabeth Emery, producer and host of Hear Her Sports, the podcast about exceptional female athletes and women in sports. If you like this podcast, please tell your friends, both athletic and not athletic. There's no requirement to be a professional athlete to listen to Hear Her Sports. Being physically active brings strength and confidence at any level. Today, my guest is Elizabeth Streb. She's a choreographer, founder of the Streb Lab for Action Mechanics, known as SLAM, located in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. She's also an extraordinary innovator and thinker. She's won the MacArthur Foundation or Genius Grant, two Bessie Awards, and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, Creative Capital, National Endowment for the Arts, and the Mellon. During our conversation, I reference her book, How to Become an Extreme Action Hero. Note that she calls her dancers action heroes. The book is part biography and part theory, her theories of movement. Elizabeth Streb, in the book and also in the studio, digs down to the building blocks of movement, bringing together time, space, and action. A story from the book brought those three elements together for me. As a kid in the kitchen at about nine years old, with her parents as an audience, she caught a slowly slipping full box of nuts and bolts with, quote, perfect timing and spatial aim. She caught the box about an inch before it hit the ground while she dropped to a deep plie at the last second. What struck me most about this story is the awareness that she had of her body, of the box, and the space and time between the two. Find links to her book, Slam, and the movie Born to Fly, Elizabeth Streb vs. Gravity, in the episode notes on hearhersports.com. So get ready. Here we go. I started off asking how Elizabeth defines extreme action and movement. And action, I, mean, I veer between extreme action and movement, naming it movement. But the difference is, I think, in my analysis, that um, movement can be almost anything that is disturbed by the wind it can be self-initiated or it's initiated by outside forces and all of those issues come into play with what Streb does with the body. However, extreme action has certain principles or action has certain principles that define it in a more, I think, specific and rugged way than just calling something movement. I'm not an academic or a scholar or um, someone who thinks deeply about the critique of movement or dance I do think deeply about it, but not from that vantage point, you know, looking over the landscape. I sort of look, I'm the worm's eye view. So I may be right, I may be wrong, and I may not be the one to establish action as a new theatrical form, but I definitely eventually think it will be. Got it. I loved your story in the book about you as a kid catching that box of nuts and bolts. Yes. So I wanted you to talk about that. And also part of that question is, is that what you're doing with your dancers? Are you sort of shoving them out into this limited space and asking them to figure out their relationship to everything else that's within that space and sort of the time process that you're forcing upon it? I, I would say yes to that. the latter comment that you made. They, they are chosen as engineer, Trojan, gladiator types with brave hearts. And they have ultimate skill, you know, a body that is not encumbered by any chronic problem because it can't be. And uh, they're very apt at locating their weakest link and addressing that. So nothing stops them from continuing to grow. And that assists their investigation um, when they enter into, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, they enter into our devices or our design for altering space and its encumbrances and also altering the forces that they encounter there. And that has to do with our instruments and the design of them and uh, really attempting to, with the design of these instruments, you know, ever evolving, trying to locate a topography, geography, force field that is not one we've encountered before. And that is their, their, their sort of battle cry to figure out, well, what can, what can I do here? And then I observe and try and ask questions um, as uh, fundamental as they may be sometimes, but that's the process. It's very heuristic. And I, I was interested that, you know, like seeing those machines in videos makes it seem sort of like spectacle, but that's really not your point. You know, it's not my point, but my point is to go higher, faster, sooner, harder. <laughs> so that is the manner in which we feel that this is a theatrical form. Um, we, we really want to... Uh, understand 
what's the iambic pentameter of action? How can I, how can I calibrate the rhythm of action, the image of action, uh, moments that happen that seem unpre- that are unpredictable and seem accidental, so that it never ever the audience cannot turn away. You know, so even though I don't I don't say I'm out to make a spectacle, it, it's a human spectacle in lots of ways. Yes, uh, but it also seems like it's it's um, you're trying to flip them around. You're trying to flip their mind around. Or oh, absolutely. Confuse them. Yeah. Confuse, confuse them and make them feel that they don't know where they are, the audience, I mean. You know, that would be because if you you give them as much of an experience, a kin- kinesthetic experience, phenomenological experience, brain experience, as much as you can without asking them to come up on stage and get hurt. It, it seems so hard to get the audience to actually understand. I mean, like you have a regular person in your audience and you're asking them to make this huge leap of understanding, you know, like how do the, how do you sort of put them in the body of your action heroes? Well, see, see, we really believe that action is a universal language and there isn't anyone out there that hasn't accidentally fallen down, you know, whether they're two feet from the ground or six feet from the ground or in their youth tried something they got hurt doing or, or witnessed an accident or, you know, so I feel that, that they can relate to these things that are just so uh, omnipresent in the world. And so I don't feel that I'm talking across a vast um, problem with language, you know, even though our language is physically based. What, when we talk to our audience, when we do what we do in front of them, they, they are right there with us. They, they, they know what's going on up there. Huh, that's, that's, that's interesting. Because I always often wonder that in sport, you know, like if you haven't done that sport, are you really able to understand how hard it is? That, that's another thing. Probably, actually, it's a great point. Probably not. And obviously, we're, we're not trying to fly through the air with the greatest of ease. And right. we are definitely, tr- you know, we all know that we agree to make action to flinch for, you know, to whether it's a, a flinching heart, mind, body or soul. Um, but I, I, you know, it's a guessing game, Elizabeth, you know, I'm not sure what the whole world thinks about action or about Strab, but I, I feel that, you know, my, uh, eye on the prize here, my like obsession with this thing that started maybe with the nuts and bolts, as you mentioned, when I got such a reaction from my two parents, I was like, whoa, I'm onto this. I'm onto something here, you know, and I might've been nine years old, but anyway, I, I've never fallen out of love with this investigation for all the reasons you're mentioning. Like, no, they don't know how hard it is, but maybe that's not the point. Right. But, but, but the audience is so important to you. I mean, that was clear from your book that, you know, you think about that all the time is how do you get your audience engaged in what you guys are doing? That, that, that is, I do think about it all the time. Not, not necessarily when I'm making a new piece, but the other thing is we have, um, Zaire Baptiste, who, if you've seen any of the videos you might have encountered, he, he's our MC, kind of our empresario, our DJ, when we don't have a local DJ. Um, and he tells the audience right at the beginning, you know, take out your, take out your iPhones, hashtag us, you know, put us up on Facebook, tell your friends how much fun you're having. So the audience, and we leave the house lights up a little, we don't have fancy lighting with our newest show called C, uh, Strab Extreme Actions. You know, we, we sort of give the signal first that, because one of the biggest um, bulwarks to this, and, and I think you can imagine, is the way the audience is inured to behave in a classic theater. Right. Don't you know, move. Don't move and please <laughs> be quiet. Yeah, don't move. Please be quiet and don't express yourself. So we want them to be as loud as possible. We don't want them to fake their surprise or anything just to say, can we remove the stain of behavior that you've been, you know, uh, sort of jammed into out of habit and maybe a little bit out of myth, right. out of behavior, you know? And your dancers are doing the same, which I really like. But yes. You mean, you mean in terms of telling the audience to like l- lighten up, you mean, or what do you mean? Well, of- well, like they have facial expressions and, you know, they're actually saying something and, you know, you hear the noise of both their voice and their body. Yes, absolutely. That, that's that's a, pretty much quickly. People think maybe they're at a, you know, a monster truck rally, boxing, <laughs> match, you know, rodeo. Go, go. Can you do this? And then the joy of it all. I think the joy of it all, you know, hopefully comes across the edge of the stage into the audience. 
so when you're planning your dances and chore and choreographing them, I don't think that, that was the right word, but yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> how are you balancing creating real moves and making sure that the dancers are practiced and prepared? So, you know, you're balancing unpredictable, but also like you don't want everybody to not know what they're doing when they get on stage. Of course, of course not. Well, on stage is the last moment of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, a pretty hard taskmaster. I do not want to tell my dancers they have to work out or they have to address their weakest link or, you know, I don't want to say, you know, if they're not prepared, then they're not professional dancers that are that I want in this company. If they if they don't work out, if we have two months off and I come back and I see that they're out of shape, that is not OK. <laughs> it's not OK, but I'm not going to, like, take them by the hand and say, here's what you do when you're off. You know, no. No, I'm, I'm a monster truck. I'm a monster when it comes to that. I just have no patience. It's not, it's not, it's not college, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, but you don't send them out onto the stage in a particular dance with no, I don't, I don't even know how to ask the question because, you know, the, <laughs> the you know, the, the whole point I, I think I understand is that, you know, you're, they're reacting to real time and to each other and, you know, these, you know, the steel bars moving back and forth. So that has to be real, but they also have to know somewhat what's happening. And so how do you keep it real, but also know what's going to happen? Well, absolutely. And, and, and the, the reason, you know, we have long rehearsal periods, even just to get a piece back in shape. Uh, we're back here now. I mean, we're working on um, opening Bloomberg's new building in, in London. You know, so we're, we're kind of working on a more public corporate project. But we're also getting back into our show that will tour in January. And that is that we, we rehearse so much. We do it so many times and make sure that each person's role is called to their skill set and their capacity. So I'm gonna, sorry to ask the question again, but then how do you keep it fresh? <laughs> oh, well, I go, I, I make sure that I cut things. I change orders. I get bored. I get rid of that stuff. <laughs> I um, add more people on the trampoline or more people going off or I cut parts. I go sooner, sooner, sooner. You know, when you come back to something, you realize we like to remove, Elizabeth, all unnecessary transitions. So I never want the audience to see how we're doing something. I just want it to happen, 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 happen. Fly up kind of thing. So we tighten it up constantly. And dances can go from four minutes long, five minutes long, to three and a half minutes long over the course of a year. Huh. And it's not changing anything, just going sooner and faster, higher. So the, the reason it gets fresh is it's still very scary and it's not easy. It's just still com demands every corpuscle of your body, mind, soul to be present at that second of time and space. Right. Can you describe the physical experience of falling and hitting the ground and maybe relate it to, you know, a sport that I would understand? <laughs> I, I will admit I tried it a couple times. <laughs> you tried what? Falling? Falling on the ground. How'd it feel? Uh, I, it felt fine. It was kind of cool. And I did think that, wow, I should get stronger in my upper body. <laughs> <laughs> and it made a lot, lot bigger noise than I thought, too. Oh, I was shocked. I mean, if you're in a push-up position and then your body is perfectly straight in itself, you're not curved or, or arching or anything, and then you just allow yourself to keep your line and let your arms go, and let's say you're only a foot, from the floor, right? Maybe foot, foot and two inches. It is a massive hit, just right. a foot from right. the floor. It's a pretty exciting, I think. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's it, one thing that I was uh, struck by was that, you know, impact was very different than pain. Like it wasn't painful at all, but I definitely noticed impact. <laughs> yeah, pain, I mean, this is a, a streb cliche at this point, um, but we don't call it pain. We call it another rather interesting foreign sensation. And that way you don't, when people get hurt, they tend to veer away from that, you know, veer away from that sensation of piercing uncomfortability. But if you just realize, oh, I can acclimate to that, I can acclimate to that, and there's really nothing except for an incorrect land that can stop me from going further, further, further. I think that's 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 the plan. Um, and and the, the other thing, I just wanted to go back when you say like, how do you how do you approach this work? And I have this amazing um, physicist. Her name is Jana Levin, 
and um, the book I've read, Mad Men and Turing Machines. She's just amazing. And she said, I think we spend a lot of time finding the thoughts that contradict what we know. And I think that that is our essence. I like to say you try and construct a question that's so unquestionably true you don't think to ask it. And I think that that's where the whole thing begins. That's where the whole thing begins. And the pain thing is is a is a is a subset of that, you know, of course, because it always stop people flinch and then they go back from the edge and don't don't push themselves to create something that no one's ever seen before. Right. You know, it seems to me that the danger is important to what you do, but that's not really what you it's not like you're looking for danger. It's just a means to get to the results that you want. Or am I misinterpreting? No, you're not. You're not misinterpreting at all. Actually, um, I think that I think that it's it's I think you're right. It's hard to say. Do I I think my reputation is that sometimes people who don't like strep, they'll say, oh, she hurts people. People get hurt in there. Um, that's just, you know, it's been 30 years and that's not the only true thing about what we do, but we do agree to get a little hurt. You know, it, it, it's, it's it, like this whole idea of taking special care of yourself and worrying too much about your body or your future is really, uh, antithetical to investigating real movement, real action, and all of the, uh, perimeters that you have to break to enter the zone of what a real move might be or where, and there'll always be danger residing there always. Right. But the, the, the point is to discover movement, not to discover getting hurt. <laughs> oh, you are absolutely right with that. That is a truism, that statement. It, it's just saying if you're, there's a point at which you're saying, oh, I can't, I want, I want the answers that no, they cannot do that yet. Right. You know, I want somebody to do a triple tour uh, horizontally or uh, a fr front of back flip or fall from 30 feet if they haven't fallen from five, from one foot, from 10 feet, you know, first. Like I can see that they're not ready to do something and I do not want them to do it if they're not ready. Um, so it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a many, uh, many pronged problem that is morphing all the time, you know? And you had asked me just a second ago about what sports do I relate to that remind me of what we're doing and that I admire them. And, you know, it's not circus. I know that's not a sport, but they never land. Uh, there are so many uh, action things like circus or um, acrobatics in a way. They land on their feet, but they don't land from far up onto their full body. And so we distinguish ourselves like that. And I think American football and boxing are two sports that I, I find very inspiring because because they, they let their bodies get pummeled, you know, and obviously, you know, I know they're dangerous sports. I know that, but um, they're the two that I relate to the most. All sports you have, there is a danger. I mean, I'm, I come from a cycling background, of course, and the number of times that I've hit the ground is, you know, more than, right. <laughs> more than fingers I have. And it's just part of the sport and you accept it. And, you know, I mean, from what I've read of what's happened at your place, it seems no different to me. <laughs> It's no different except for we, you know, the only thing is um, my, my equipment. I try to not design or use equipment. Like I would never use a bicycle. You know, I would never use a ladder or a chair. But we have a ladder that spins right. on a structure. And that, that sort of defies the normal um, use of a ladder. And so it becomes, it becomes um, not not normal, I guess. You know, I really get attracted to the not normal um, set of efforts that create um, a magical moment, you know. And it's, it comes from rhythm. And I'm always trying to figure out what's, what's, a, what's a real unique rhythm of music. And I wish dance would stop using music because they're just cheating, really. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about rhythm? I, I am a little not quite clear on that. Well, um, and I am definitely not clear on that it's but i think that if you if you are in a subject and you're saying okay what's the real what's the content what's a potential content that this particular activity such as action movement can provoke that no other discipline has the capacity to provoke 
um, that's, that would be a query that I think every artist in their discipline has to ask so that they at least get down to the rubrics of the grammar and the syntax, et cetera. So you have building blocks that start from scratch, not 20, 20, 20 stories up away from the fact of the matter. So um, I think, I mean, I think that the notion of timing I've decided is what ends up carrying the content of action the way Shakespeare deciding that iambic pentameter was the right rhythm for his plays or his sentences or his lines. And he, I, I'm surprised he only used that. I think maybe I'm not a scholar of Shakespeare, but so I'm looking for that idea in action. And I, and I know that if my dancers wait too long to go, if my dancers change the um, moment, I mean, you can't control landing, but you control initiating. And then every so often, Elizabeth, I'm like, that's it, that's it. But because there's no nomenclature to name a rhythm of action, rhythm of movement, there is in music with sounds, but not with movement, with moves, because it's, it's much more complex, I believe. Does that? I think I'm getting there. Um, but, but each dance, each dance will have its separate rhythm. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And because we're in a different place in space, and in place in space, there's different forces and different turbulences that are inaugurated by the situation. And so it's always a different rhythm. But my, my, my sadness, my worry is that if people haven't named something, if something is not named or a body of knowledge has no lexicon, then people don't perceive it. And so they'll just go ahead and look at the body, you know, which is a, the most boring part of what we do. Are you going to name all those things? No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I can't because I'm busy doing what I'm doing. And so, but I think like, let's say, let's say Elizabeth, you look up into space on the theater stage, right? Now, every single hunk of space, like a millimeter by a millimeter should be named. It should be named. It's like an octave, you know, or like a key music names, all those things. And so, it's, it's a different decision to go to certain places in space. And as you pass through them, you're either turning or you know, doing something with your body that alters your capacity to occupy that spot in space for longer or less long. And, and it's, it's, it's not arbitrary, and yet it's not named. So it just goes by in a blur. I, lo I love all the abstract thoughts. And I had this weird thing in reading your book. I was thinking... You know, you're making it, a movement sound like an object, you know, because it has a force, you know, it, it can it can create a force on other objects. It can create a force in the space, you know, like it had a real physical presence the way that you were describing it. And I think it does because it has this physical uh, um, reaction that gets, gets um, brought out of the audience. And, and the other funny thing is, when you think scientifically, which I which I don't, I just steal thoughts scientifically and probably um, probably mis mis misassign them. But um, it's said that if you uh, if a, an event happens in one two thousandth of a second, no no human can perceive that one two thousandth of a second. It's like an explosion. It's a blur. But but we can perceive things that happen in one tenth of a second then you can pay attention to that. And so one-tenth of a second is not still not very long. You know, but I think it's interesting about the perceptual capacities of humans and how it's geared to um, duration and how short the duration is. And, and when it gets shorter and shorter and shorter, up to one two-thousandth of a second, it's, it's just not perceivable anymore. Right. Do you, do you find that you're – I mean, are you, have you been on your machines? Are you – yourself to experiment with them first or are you able to see your dancers and totally understand what what the questions are to ask um well that that process right now i do not know not now at one time um i, I think i started this in 77 78 i started this investigation and then from that till i i basically got off the equipment when i and, and when i was 47 so i was 28 to 47 I was on the equipment. Of course, the equipment has continued to get much more sophisticated, more dangerous, more complex. And I do not, uh, I'm a private dancer at this point. I do not come here at midnight and hop on the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> no, I leave the things of youth to youth. And no, I can do, I can let extreme things happen to me uh, now and again. Uh, and so I try and stay in shape for that. Um, <laughs> 
but you probably hear my dancers in the background. They're yes. building the trampoline and they're trying to be as quiet as possible, but they're they're just they're noisemakers, you know. That's why it's so spectacular. Yeah. So you just had auditions. How did that go? And what were you looking for? I, I was looking for two phenomenal just out of this world, you know, action heroes, gladiators, Trojans, warriors, and we found them. We found one woman and one man, and they are really, you know, they're here, they're here now, just getting started, and it'll go slow, you know, it goes slowly with new people, so we don't, we don't scare them too much. Yeah, I mean, what kind of background do they have? And as you said, it takes time to learn the Streb method, so what do they have that attracts you? Um, the, the thing that I try, I mean, just most of my dancers are trained rigorously in dance for years and years and years and years. They come here with that training and that knowledge. And I don't really use dance as dance, but it's the most thorough training system, both for placement of the muscles on the bones, for strength. Always the women have to develop their upper body. There's no way around that. And the men usually have to develop a little finesse in the lower part of their body. Like they get away more often with not pointing their feet and straightening their knees and keeping their legs together. Uh, so there's opposite attributes to each to each gender, even though we know there's thousands of genders. Um, but I look for I look for when they start to move, they have lost themselves. They're in a mad zone of, you know, just the, the, the battle of the ground, the battle to leave the ground, just the resting of the human physical form off the ground that they are not trying to be quote unquote good dancers. They are so deeply in their entity that they are oblivious to everything but that move that they're on. I look for that. I look for I look for people who are mad, mad, rabid dogs, animals. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're scary. I want to look for someone, even in the situation, the guise of an audition, who's not trying to impress me, which is or my dancers. And I know that's a difficult thing to ask, because of course, no kidding. But but. People, there are certain movers, when they start to move, everything else but that physical feeling and that <clears throat> zone uh, leaves them. And they are, they are those physical, those are physical beings that I want in this company. Nice. And so they'll, yeah. they'll be, you'll consider them new for a year? Usually it takes, yes, definitely a year, if not longer. It depends on the person, but um, it's so many things. We'll start them off very slowly and um, that then work them in. But they, they have to keep working, you know. I mean, if somebody all of a sudden can't – you have to grow at a certain pace so that, you know, if someone gets injured, which happens a lot, especially on the road, I need them after a year or less to be able to understudy and fill in and step up. So I, I, I need active people who are really going to take it seriously and, you know. And be ready when I need them. Right. What is the daily life of your action heroes like? Well, <clears throat> I don't know what happens before they get here. Hopefully they're working out really hard or going to a battle <laughs> class, you know, that kind of thing. So they keep growing themselves and keeping themselves fit. And then they come here. Our rehearsals are from 1130 to 330 from Tuesday through Friday. And what we do there is go through. We have a, a litany of things we need to prepare Right now we're preparing for London and Paris, and so we'll work on the trampoline today. And so they come in, they have to set up the equipment. You know, we don't have a whole tech team here full-time that does that, so we have to do it. And then they get working on, on the equipment and on the choreography for those four hours. Right. That's quite a lot of rehearsal. It, it actually is for this form. I've, I've gone as much as 25 hours a week, five, five hours a day, five days a week, and it's it doesn't work. It's too battering to the body. So this is a perfect amount of time, you know, with the caveat, they're taking care of their body on their own outside of here, which, you know, in my generation, certainly dancers did. Do you have support people on staff? I don't know, massage people, nutritionists, anything like that, or you're, you're totally expecting them to take care of all of that by themselves. They're grownups. Yes. No, I don't have them on staff, th those kind of people. I have executive directors, administrators, um, you know, runners of the school that we have here, all of that type of thing, development people. Um, but in terms of we, we don't we don't have that. But when we're performing, they get body work sessions. I don't know what the schedule is for that. But if we're performing here at SLAM or in New York City, um, we provide them with a certain amount of that and also um, on the road. Got it. Sort of more 
philosophically, what kind of questions are you looking at now? Like long-term questions you're trying to answer. Well, the question, I'm trying to come up with questions. That's the, the thing is always the hardest thing is what's your next question. Um, and uh, we, we touched on instant acceleration um, because it's so difficult for a stage body event to look fast. And the idea, when you watch a fly in a mason jar, you know how it can change direction radically without smashing its body against the glass? Mm -hmm. have, you, have you watched flies in mason jars? Yes. <laughs> Not recently, but I do know what you're talking about. So I wanted to see, is that possible theatrically? You know, and so we got things in here. This is now a number of years ago called jerk vests and air rams. And the air ram is a pneumatic device that you step on and then fly horizontally 20 feet or more. And the jerk vests are done either with pneumatic devices or cables with, you know, pullers. And it was so beautiful. Um, but I had to abandon it because it was, it got too dangerous. People keep kept them, um, uh, you know, hurting their ankles and whatnot. So I'm, I'm interested in figuring out how I can find the fabric of a different sort of movement that's not self-initiated or and what piece of equipment haven't we done or could we use substance like so you would work with action that um, that is affected by water. And so you move, you see, you see what actions affect on substances. Like what would that be? Cool. Uh, that creates terrible mess on stage and no one likes that. So everything that and then the other thing I'm, I'm very interested in and I've made a million drawings of it, but is to have on stage, maybe even it would be an installation, not a, not part of a show, um, the presence of reflection mirror-like thing, a uh, reflection, projection, um, and uh, shadows and lifetime, sort of all at once, creating a physical, spatial um, confusion for the audience, trying to unravel what is real and what is pre-recorded and what is live, and is this reflected or projected, or is it... Um, you know, uh, a, a camera angle that's live, but from another place on stage, you know, so I'm really fascinated by creating the magic and confusion of what's real, what's not real, but it's all movement. That's cool. I know. I, I just, it just hasn't, hasn't, uh, I, I don't know quite how to design the situation, but I, I know that's the idea. So that sort of thing. Cool. So one more practical question. I noticed that you have a kid action school. Um, yes. What, how long has that been running and what have you been learning from the kids? That's been, I mean, we started that actually way back in Philadelphia in 90 or 91 or maybe even 89. And then when I had my Canal Street studio from 77 to 95, we actually had kids action there. And then after 95, we went to a bunch of different garages before Slam and we would have some version of kids action. So we got here, this Kids Action program, which is the most robust, started in um, 2003, and it's been going all this time, so 14 years. And we have now about 650 kids a week and 60 classes for the after-school program and the weekend program. And they go from age 18 months all the way up to adults. And it's pretty, obs it's obsessive, and I've found that over these years the uh, essence of children and play because it really is about play that's what people like to watch um, a move that's not too planned so it takes the uh, juice out of it but watching the children I really believe in their magic I really believe that the dancers have started to perform like children and what have the, the kids got out of it I mean obviously physical abilities but you know I would expect they get a lot more than that Oh, so much more. I mean, the self-esteem, because we are a personal best situation here at Strab physically. And so you can be fat, skinny, tall, short, you know, twisted every which way. But we are interested. And in, well, what can your body do that no other body on earth can do? I mean, that's, that's a whole inquiry for modern dance, right? To increase the language's richness of mo movement, language's richness. And so we're not particular. You don't have to be a balancing skinny dancer. In fact, I don't care for that look. But these kids come in, and especially the girls and the young boys, and they all play together. And it's really a pretty amazing to take in the profundity of what happens with them. Yeah, I would think they would also learn, you know, like 
it's not so bad to fall down. Oh, they already know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they keep it maybe longer than they might. You know, they totally keep it longer. And what the problem is are the mothers and the fathers on the perimeter. You know, they, they uh, probably in, inflict a bit of worry into their kids more than those kids have. Some of them are delicate, but not really. Right. Maybe the, maybe the parents learn something as well. I, I, think, I think they do. And, it's, and we also have, um, Elizabeth, we have a flying trapeze here. So the kids' action is, can, be, can be part of that um, if they are, I think it's four years old or 50 pounds, whichever comes first. I'm making that up, but I think that's right. Maybe it's five years old. Mm-hmm. They, they can be in the, the kids' fly class. So they do all, all of them at once. It's just really, uh, and my dancers teach the kids. That's the other very powerful, you know, passing the wand of information from the real action heroes in my company to these young, beautiful humans. That's so great. Well, I really appreciate your time. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? Well, I, I wanted, I have this sort of litany uh, that are what's called new rules of conduct there it's in the book also um how to become an extreme action hero but it it these these ideas kind of exploded out of a question that i had because i didn't start dancing until i was 17 and so i noticed all these things that i thought only an idiot savant could notice and i never voiced them until we until you know i felt they were reasonable questions but can i just go through a few of those please so um, if they're called new rules for conduct, it's also about wa- who's in your audience and watching and feeling and who's participating and all these you know, social questions as well as physical questions. So there's no start times. You know, that's sort of a drag. Like the show starts at eight o'clock. Um, there's not a lot we can do about that in the world. But I think that that's kind of a, it seems like young kids really rather just walk in and walk out, you know, and not have to be uh, so pushed around by the start and ending times. And then question necessary duration. How long should something be? Noise, keep the, keep the noise outside and keep um, the inside out. So we like noisy environments and we don't care if the public and strangers come and interrupt us. That's part of our, um, one of our raison d'etre. Um, it's sort of like don't leave the stuff of life at the door. Do whatever you want whenever you can. Have all ages, races, classes. Change use groups rather than the ones you're just so comfortable around. Get uncomfortable. Um, and then the whole Jane Jacobian thing, really. Short blocks, turn off and figure out how to make the sidewalk a public place that everybody gets involved in. Vary the economic yield they, that the buildings in a neighborhood have to produce. We've done a lot with gentrification. We've been in the middle of it in Soho and also here in Williamsburg. And then... Um, have no doors, offer something that someone needs, you know, not, not that whole education thing in the art world where you say, oh, they don't understand. They, I think we, if they're young, you could bring them to the theater and they get used to it rather than saying, you know, well, they're not interested in what you're doing. Don't you get it? You don't have to educate them. So the notion of figuring out what possibly within what I have made could the general public care about. Anyway, then there is this, there is this beautiful quote, uh, by Tony Kushner that uh, said when he was doing Angels in America. Is it all right if I read that? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Very short, but it always has been kind of in my heart when I think of flying and whatnot and the horror of flight, you know, and how sometimes when you watch a, a duck, you know, sail smoothly across a pond and then you look underwater, the, the madness and fury of their feet, web, web, webbed feet and legs is just so scary and wild so he he said quote how else should an angel land on earth but with the utmost difficulty if we are to be visited by angels we will have to call them down with sweat and strain we will have to drag them out of the skies and so i think that even though we are a clumsy lot at streb and people search they seem to search endlessly for grace we really do end up redefining grace and what that means in physical terms I like that. You know, I don't. I don't want to. I, mean, I hesitate to bring in politics, but one of the one of your <laughs> points that I really like is this: get uncomfortable. You know, I, I think yeah. we would all learn a lot from that. Um, to get uncomfortable. Yes, and yes. I I I absolutely agree with you, and I think that it's the hardest thing as human go through life 
they really don't like that, you know, to get uncomfortable and be around difference or be around someone who might be a stranger. And I think by having this be a public place and it's just word of mouth, but people come in and watch the rehearsals. And I actually have been haunted by the feeling that, wow, these are more interesting than my shows. <laughs> the rehearsals are more interesting than my shows. <laughs> Because uh, they're unplanned, you know what I mean? And people sit there raptly. I don't know. I, I'll have to ponder that a little, I think. Well, that sort of gets to the question that I that I asked early on. It's like, how are you balancing that unknown and, and known? Uh, yeah, that's a provocative question, I think. And I think, that, I think that the unknown is sort of hard to, hard to uh, have be a part of anything. Because how the heck? What do you do with that? Right. I think about that a lot in my own art practice because, you know, if you make something too much, you're too familiar with it and it loses whatever it had when you started, yeah. even though it may be more perfect. I know. I know. It just gets ruined. Totally. <laughs> it's just what do we do about that thing where I think actually you can't repeat action. You know, it gets ruined. It does get ruined. And I think I don't know what to do about that since that you do have to have an economy. You have to <laughs> have something to sell. You know, it's kind of, um, could I, could I, I, I found a few more of those things. Could I read them? They're more about the action I think you're interested in. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so break the rules. Um, get two bodies to occupy the same space at the same time. Make, name a move you are unwilling to do and do it. Name an impossible move, do it, stop being careful, get hurt, invent a mistake, move so fast you stand still. You know how when you put your finger in front of your eyes and move it really quickly by and you look straight ahead? Like move that fast. Uh, have order, disintegrate, go in more than one direction at a time, fall, don't hit the ground, disappear. Action is a verb, switch it to a noun. Be out of control. Skip a spot in space when falling. Uh, employ unpredictability. Eliminate transition. Develop necessary and sufficient criteria for movement and get rid of everything else. Learn to fly. Learn to fall. Stop worrying about your future. Yeah, I love that list of the impossible moves. I can't remember what you called them, but, you know, like skipping, skipping time or skipping space. I thought that was yep. really cool. I know. How did you do that? How would you do that? <laughs> You know, know. A mathematician posed it to me at, when I was at, at, in Berkeley one year. And he goes, well, when you're falling, do you like, you know how an asymptote, when you're following a line, when you get to the asymptote, there's no value there? It's a mathematical thing. You can't, you know, that's where there's no answers and no value. And he goes, so do that and skip a spot in space. <laughs> I go, oh, yeah, okay. You know, let me work on that. But it's, it's I've, never, I've never been able to, while you're falling, I've never been able to, I guess you have to disappear and reappear, right? I don't know what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like a hop. A hop, yes. Like a hop. A, Somebody, a like, time hop. A time hop, yeah. Let me write that down. Time hop. Time hop. But someone said, like, these high-speed winches can drag you, one piece we did in the London Olympics, 30 feet a second. And then if you're in the movies, they can actually drag a car 70 feet a second, but the brain wouldn't be able to handle the G-forces at all. Huh. But, but if you're falling, they usually just let gravity fall at the 32 feet per second squared. But if you want to fall faster than gravity, you get attached to one of these high-speed winches. Because <laughs> they're whammos. <laughs> but then you can't, you got to skip the earth, of course, because, because of my, my rigor, Robin Elias in London, says, you know, you always have to de-accelerate before you change directions. And I'm like, why? Just change directions. <laughs> anyway. Maybe this is where your video comes in. <laughs> it, it can fake it. That would be cheating, I think. We don't want to <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I love talking to you. Yeah, same here. We could just go on all day, I think. I think right. I could. Okay, great, Elizabeth. Thank Wonderful you so much. Coffee. Pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening. It's a huge help for Hear Her Sports and allows more sporty and non-sporty types to find the podcast and learn more about female athletes. Sign up for the newsletter and get a link to a Spotify playlist of favorite workout songs of some of my guests. 
And finally, please support the podcast by telling your friends about it, donating, or purchasing a Hear Her Sports notebook. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Bye-bye.